Okay, hello and welcome everybody. I am going to stop sharing my screen briefly so I can offer our welcome and introduction to the second Lustrum webinar. Um, so my name is Sarah Lasoye. I'm the Program Administrator and Research Assistant with the Lustrum Study. Um, and really thank you all for joining us for the second of our final kind of end of study webinars. So briefly, before I hand over to our brilliant speakers, um, I'm gonna do a short introduction to Lustrum's work. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with Lustrum, um, it's, we are a five-year program of research funded by the National Institute for Health Research, NIHR, and led by Professor Claudia Escort. And Lustrum's core aim is improving the sexual health of heterosexual people and men who have sex with men by preventing transmission of sexually transmitted infections and reducing undiagnosed HIV. So since April 2016, our multidisciplinary team of co-investigators um, have been hard at work delivering on Lustrum's three streams of activity, um, each stream contributing to the program's core aim of preventing the transmission of sexually transmitted infections um, and reducing undiagnosed HIV through improved partner notification strategies. And in early 2020, we successfully completed our Lustrum Accelerated Partner Therapy APT Chlamydia Partner Notification Trial um, and are incredibly grateful to the all of our committed colleagues across the 17 trial sites for their support in doing this work. Um, and today we'll be exploring the APT trial methodology with our brilliant speakers. Um, if you'd like to know more about Lustrum, um, Lustrum's programme of work, visit our website at lustrum.org.uk. And to keep up to date with our outputs, follow us on Twitter at lustrum underscore five. So I'm going to briefly check if we have our chair. So our chair, Ms. Kuku Nari, will be joining us shortly. Um, but as she is still currently tied up, I'm going to offer a quick introduction to our speakers. Um, so bear with me one second. Great, so I'm going to double check that I can share my screen with you. And, oh, I'm just gonna offer the introductions without it. So Professor Andrew Copas uh, is Professor of Trials in Global Health jointly in the Institute for Global Health and at the Hub for Trials Methodology Research at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit. Um, I heard an entry. Oh, hi, Artemis. Artemis has luckily just joined us. Um, Artemis, I'm going to share my screen with the speaker profiles. If you want to jump in and do the speaker introductions now, I was just about to start, but you timed that perfectly. Um, so let me share that now. Oh, apologies, one second. There we go. After you, Artemis. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to be a part of this uh, uh, discussion. I'm uh, Artemis Kupnari. I uh, work as a data scientist in the personalized healthcare function of uh, Rose for seven months now. Uh, Within that uh, role, we uh, have also an interest uh, in uh, um, real uh, world pragmatic randomized studies. So it's uh, it's great to to uh, be able to uh, participate in this. Uh, and uh, um, I have uh, um, uh, I have a background in uh, statistics and statistical epidemiology. Before that role, I've worked uh, in academia, and through that journey, I had the uh, great pleasure and honor to meet uh, uh, Andrew Kopas, with whom we have co-authored a, a paper on chlamydia infection. Uh, 
so I will uh, uh, pass with uh, uh, now the introductions. Uh, Andrew Kopas is a, a professor of trials in global health, jointly at the Institute for Global Health and at the Hub for Trials Methodology Research at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit. He's a lead statistician for several ongoing trials in the UK and overseas, many of which are cluster randomized, including parallel group crossover and stepped wedge designs. Within the MRC Clinical Trials Unit, he pursues a program of methodological research, which includes methods for cluster randomized trials, and in particular, optimizing the design of trials with baseline data and step wedge trials. He retains an interest in repeated measurements data and missing data, and is looking to develop work on the implications for design and analysis of trials with complex interventions, of needing multiple primary outcomes to reflect the range of impact of the intervention. Uh, then our second speaker is uh, Oliver Stirrup, who is a research associate at the uh, University College London, and he is currently the trial statistician for three studies. He completed his PhD on statistical modeling of uh, HIV biomarker data at UCL in 2016. And subsequently, he spent several years conducting research on HIV drug resistance and epidemiology. His ongoing research interests lie in the development and implementation of new statistical methods. And lastly, but not least, we have uh, uh, Nicola Law, who is a professor of uh, epidemiology and public health, director of research and leader of the sexual and reproductive health research group, at the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine, University of Bern in Switzerland. Her research focuses on the epidemiology, prevention and control of emerging infectious diseases and sexually transmitted infections. Professor Law uses a wide range of research methods with expertise in systematic reviews of aggregated and individual participant data, community-based observational and randomized studies, all over the world in Australia, the Netherlands, Papua New Guinea, South Africa, United Kingdom and Zambia, mathematical modeling and mixed method research. Um, uh, for uh, the first half of this uh, uh, webinar, we'll hear a short, roughly 10 minute presentation from each speaker related to the methodology of last room's APT trial the successes and limitations of cluster randomized control trials, crossover design, the challenges and the issues in the trial data analysis, and the potential uses of crossover design beyond the Lustrum study, how the evolving design of cluster trials can be utilized in wider sexually transmitted infections research. And for the second half of this we uh, webinar, we'll delve further into these questions uh, in uh, panel discussion. And of course, we will mainly open up to the audience questions uh, before we finally close. And if you have any questions and you'd like the panelists to respond to, please do post them into the Q&A. Thank you very much. And now over to Andrew. Thank you very much. Artemis, uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the first uh, presentation. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm gonna be talking today about design options and decisions that we made uh, for the Lustrum trial. And if you'd like further details, um, then we have a, a protocol uh, article published in BMJ Open. So um, here's just a sort of a short introduction to the intervention and the objective. Uh, some of you may know this already. The uh, intervention tested in the Lustrum trial is APT. It's a novel approach to PM designed to facilitate and accelerate testing and treatment uh, of partners of people with chlamydia. 
And it basically involved um, when an index case came to the clinic, the, the staff would attempt to make uh, phone contact uh, with the partner, ideally on the spot and arrange a phone consultation, which could lead to them taking, uh, making arrangements to get their treatment quickly, potentially even the same day. And it's important to know that APT was offered as an option in addition to routine partner notification. So this, it's still the routine options, all the other options are still there on the table. It's a choice made by the index patient. The setting was 17 sexual health clinics in England and Scotland. And the primary objective is to evaluate, evaluate whether this offer of APT reduces chlamydia positivity at 12, 12 to 24 weeks uh, afterwards, follow up in uh, index patients. That was the primary outcome. So in this presentation, I'm going to describe the decision process behind choosing the cluster crossover design uh, that we chose. And then I'm gonna move on briefly at the end to talk about some of the recruitment issues that we faced. So if I'm going to split it up into different decisions, so the first decision is whether to have an individual or cluster randomised trial, fundamental decision. And individually randomised trials are always more efficient, they need fewer participants. And so therefore, this decision to have a choose a cluster randomised design is always something you need to justify, it should never be the default choice. And for Lustrum, there were two main reasons why we chose cluster randomization. The first was logistics. It would be difficult to randomize patients in real time and also difficult to avoid contamination. Um, so if clinics are alternating between uh, just routine and routine plus the offer of APT, then it may be that uh, the APT would end up being offered to some patients uh, that were meant to be control patients. There could be contamination. The other reason is a pragmatic. Implement, trying to implement the intervention as a routine um, inter intervention with, in other words, with service level consent, but no individual consent of trying to make it available to everyone can reveal its impact in real life. Okay, but then the next decision is having decided that cluster randomization is important, which design are you actually going to choose? And I'm presenting here in these diagrams four perfectly reasonable choices that we could have made for the Lustrum trial. And I've simplified it here to just imagine that we have six clinics and moving along the horizontal axis, we have time. So perhaps we have, we have four months here. Let's imagine patients are gradually recruited uh, over those four months. So in the top left, uh, that's the classic design, if you like, what we might call parallel group. So half the clinics at random, they just recruit patients to the control condition, routine PN. And then the other half the clinics, they immediately start recruiting patients into routine plus APT. And they just do that all the way through the trial. So that's the classic design. Top right, on the other hand, this is where all the clinics for the first two months, they just recruit people for routine PN. And then only in half the clinics do we switch to uh, offering APT as well. So this you might call a sort of a, a parallel group, but with baseline. And then bottom left, uh, as the picture suggests, that's the step wedge design. And bottom right, that's the crossover design. That is the design that we actually chose for Lustrum. Now, why did we choose then a uh, crossover rather than one of the other three? Well, one of the important factors is to think first, how are individuals exposed and, and measured. So sometimes individuals in a trial, they're a cohort, they're measured repeatedly over time as they're subject to different exposures. It could be patients with a chronic condition. And this can make some of these longitudinal kind of designs like a step wedge or crossover problematic. And this is really because they're going to receive both the control and the intervention at different times and they're waiting to get their intervention or waiting to go back to control, that could affect the response. So this is a slightly sort of messy situation unless things are very stable over time. But for us, we're lucky Lustrum is what I would call a continuous recruitment and short exposure design. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. This is ideal for longitudinal designs as the patients don't wait. They just get recruited. They turn up on a day, they're recruited. 
and they only receive one exposure. So they're not hanging around in the trial for a long time. They just turn up and they get their exposure and, that, and that's it. And related to that, there's a question of, well, how quickly can we switch between control and, in, and intervention? Because that could affect our choice as well. If we can't switch quickly uh, between control and intervention or, or back again, this may make a longitudinal design inefficient, inefficient, because we may have to have big breaks in recruitment whilst we do the switching. A quick switch requires any logistical changes and training for staff. It's got to be done either very quickly or done sort of in the, in the background. And it also requires short exposure for the participants. In Lustrum, the staff training for intervention was done in the background before the switch. And then the APT packs that are an important part of the intervention, well, they can be provided, they can be delivered or taken away quickly. So there's no problems with doing a quick switch in that, in that sense. The other reason we can do a quick switch is because index patients are only exposed on typically one the single day that they attend. If the clinic switched the next day, that wouldn't affect how they or their partners were managed. So there's no problem there uh, with doing a quick switch. We actually, I've noticed here, we actually had a two week break between periods. Key factor three, can we fully revert from intervention to control? So in the, these sorts of designs, we can normally switch from control to intervention during the trial. The more important question is, can we switch back? So in some trials where an intervention is mainly about staff training, then this just isn't possible because you can't untrain staff once you've told them perhaps what you think is a better way of doing things. You can't really tell them to stop doing it anymore. And this would mean that a crossover design would not be feasible. In Lustrum, though, although there is a staff training component, when the intervention is switched back, switched off at a clinic, if we're reverting from intervention to control, this means there'll no longer be any prompts for APT. There won't be any APT packs available. And we felt that effectively uh, the clinics could fully revert back from intervention to control. It was possible. Uh, this is just a sort of a bonus question, and I think a minor question. Can we actually switch repeatedly? Because if you think you can do a crossover design like the simple one on the left, which is what we did do, well, actually, why not do the one on the right? Why not switch lots of times between intervention and control? And switching lots of times is actually slightly more informative, um, provided those switches are fast and we don't need to have breaks each time we switch. So for Lustrum, although in principle the design on the right could have been possible, uh, we thought it would probably be a headache for clinics. So to being pragmatic and thinking about what would be acceptable to clinics, given the only minor benefits in information of doing lots of switches, we just did the simple design on the left. Finally, what a, there's also a question of power, or if you like to think of it, the resources and time available. Different designs have different power. And by power, what I mean is a statistical term, meaning the chance to clearly demonstrate an intervention benefit if there is one. These longitudinal designs like step wedge and cluster crossover, they're generally more powerful if the cluster size will be large. And, th and in that case, they'll then require fewer clusters. And the cluster crossover is always the most powerful design. So here's just a, a quick example I worked out. It's similar to our, and it's very similar to our scenario for Lustrum, but not quite right. I had to sort of massage it to make it suitable for all four designs. If we imagine we had 16 clusters, four periods, every clinic recruits 40 patients in a period. We had, then we have a particular ICC, intracluster correlation, a particular autocorrelation means the correlation over time. And then, I look in, and then I looked at the power for reduction in chlamydia positivity from 10 to 5%. And I did this quite quickly and efficiently using um, a web app there. There's the link for it. And it's related to a paper by Carla Hemming and colleagues published last year in the International Journal of Epidemiology. Anyway, the, the order then of power is what I would have expected when clinics recruit a large number of patients. We see the simple, the parallel design had 70% power. If you have a baseline period of, group of recruitment at the start that goes up a bit to 73, a step wedge trial had 85, 
and the simple crossover design that we use had 89. So it shows that the, it's illustrating that the cluster crossover design can be more powerful. So you can perhaps use, um, it could either be shorter or re uh, require fewer clusters, more efficient. So now just to summarize what I've been through, the trial decisions and the reasons behind them. So we chose cluster randomization for logistical reasons and to be pragmatic. Uh, we chose the cluster crossover design for efficiency. It minimized the number of clin clinics that we needed. The design was feasible because there was no long break in recruitment needed at a switch. We could switch quite quickly. And also it's possible to fully revert back to control from intervention. So that made this design for us, it seems the best choice. Okay, so I'm moving on next to talk though, just a slightly tangential issue, some of the recruitment issues, but an, an important aspect of trial design and choice. So a fully, what I would call a fully pragmatic uh, cluster RCT would implement the intervention as routine practice. So there's a sense there's a complete recruitment and measurement of everyone who's eligible. To achieve that then you're often going to need uh, a waiver of individual individual consent, no individual consent, and the outcome data is going to need to be routinely collected so that it's there for everybody. Now for Lustrum, to answer the question we were interested in, we needed to, uh, for our primary outcome, we needed to require people to take a test. Uh, they had to take a repeat chlamydia test. So that means we wouldn't manage to get the outcome for everyone, but nevertheless, uh, the pragmatism of design could be enhanced <coughs> excuse me, by maximizing the proportion of everybody eligible who actually got recruited into the trial. And where recruitment is not complete, then bias can arise if recruitment is selective, and, and especially, worst of all, if it happens to be differential between control and intervention. So maximizing recruitment obviously means optimizing consent and also the sort of the offer of participation, what happens before we uh, need that consent. So in Lustrum, what about consent? Well, we required service level consent, but we acquired a waiver for individual consent to participate in the trial. Some of the reasons why that was appropriate and why we were successful in acquiring this were that the intervention, this sort of intervention could be implemented by a clinic outside of a trial, trial context. So it's the kind of thing a clinic could do. Another important factor is that individuals retained consent to the intervention. If you remember, the intervention is actually just the offer of APT. Nobody had to use APT. So the individuals retained full control of whether they actually took that up. And also they could very easily withdraw from follow-up without any sort of detriment to their care. So they had entirely, entirely their free choice as to whether to uh, provide the repeat test, for example. So consequently, in this setting, consent, individual consent would only really be about consenting to have your anonymous outcome data analysed. So that's why it's sort of quite, that's why in this case it was uh, considered acceptable to waive that requirement. What about the sort of offer of participation in order to get there? Well, so in Lustrum, consent was passive, but recruitment required the eligible patient to be recorded into the Lustrum data system. Now that system was used as routine at some clinics, so everybody did get entered, but not at others, likely because it duplicated record keeping and hence, of course, it was a, a burden to staff who would inevitably be busy. At some clinics, it seems recruitment was limited to certain clinic sessions in the week, maybe, you know, the afternoon clinics, for example, or to particular staff who had an interest in the trial were trained to do it. Um, but at some others, it seemed it was less predictable. Now we were able to compare our recruitments to uh, GUMCAD's data uh, for the study period, that's aggregates by exposure periods. And that suggests that roughly one in five, across all the clinics, one in five el eligible patients were recruited. Although this means that biased or selective recruitment is possible, we did know that it was roughly one in five recruited in both control and intervention phases. And we also noted little difference in the characteristics of those patients recruited to the two phases. So this data sort of does suggest little differential bias, happily. So conclusions. 
So I think for Lustrum, the cluster, over, cluster crossover design is an efficient design. It's a feasible design when we can switch back to control. And it is more efficient than the fashionable um, step wedge. I think step wedge is becoming a very popular design, becoming a default design of choice for some people. Uh, but it's important to remember cluster crossover is in fact more efficient. I think there are lessons to be learned for future cluster RCTs in similar settings, particularly around how best to manage recruitment. Ideally, recruitment would be entirely passive, but if that's not possible, then efforts need to be made to minimize any staff burden. And if that burden can't be entirely addressed, then I, it may be possible perhaps uh, to talk to clinics, recruiting sites to agree a systematic approach to recruiting only a subset of patients. Thank you for listening. And I'll hand you back to um, Artemis, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, uh, great presentation. Uh, I think the floor now is to uh, Oliver. Thank you very much. So I'll just see if I can get my slides up. Um, so that should be sharing now, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of the issues in the planning and implementation of the statistical analysis for the Lustrum trial. Um, and I'm going to start off by talking about the choice of analysis model for the primary outcome. So as Andrew described, this was a crossover cluster trial. Um, and this leads to a hierarchical data structure, as I've illustrated here on this slide. Um, so we have our index patients at the lowest level who are nested within intervention and control periods for each of the clinics. Um, and for the primary outcome for these index patients, we have a binary outcome of their repeat chlamydia test at 12 to 24 weeks of follow-up. Um, so the original Lustrum protocol specified the use of a mixed effects logistic regression model for the primary outcome with fixed effects for the clinic and intervention condition together with a random effect for the clinic period. However, following an updated review of the technical methodological uh, literature regarding analysis of crossover trials with a binary outcome and some subsequent uh, simulation analyses, in the statistical analysis plan that was written prior to the conclusion of data collection, we instead specified a three-level mixed effects logistic regression model for the analysis of the primary outcome with nested random effects for the clinic and period. Um, so the reason for this was that the data that we identified flagged that the planned model structure um, was uh, susceptible to computational convergence problems. Um, and when we checked this using simulation analyses, we found that indeed there were more commonly um, computational problems using the planned model structure um, and also the um, three-level hierarchical mixed effects model had um, better properties in terms of the coverage of the confidence intervals of the estimated uh, treatment And um, So when I say that we use a three-level mixed effects model, what this means is that we're taking account into account in our analysis the fact that index patients nested within a certain period might have outcomes that are correlated with each other um, and also that periods within certain clinics might also have outcomes that are similar to each other compared to a clinic period in a, in a different clinic. Um, the study also had a secondary outcome of sex partner treatment at two weeks of follow-up and so this adds an extra level to the hierarchical data structure. And um, so we have one or more sex partner for each of the index patients um, enrolled in the study with these index patients again nested within either control or intervention periods um, and with these peri periods nested within each of the clinics included within the study. Um, and so we deal with this by adding an extra layer to the mixed effects logistic regression model when analyzing um, the secondary outcome of sex partner treatment to account for the fact that the outcomes could be correlated 
um, within each of the inlet patients. So when it came to running these analysis models in practice, the planned models did converge without any problems. However, the computational time required was quite long using standard PC. Um, so this is for running all of the analysis models for primary and secondary outcomes, but not including multiple imputation analyses. Um, and so in order to reduce the computational burden, at least in terms of the time required, I ended up using UCL computing resources also with a multi-core version of Stata um, to get this down to two to three hours, meaning I wasn't after having to run the analyses overnight on, and keeping my PC on overnight. Um, this wasn't a major issue for the present study, but it does show that some simulation might be prudent when planning analysis of trials with complex data structures, uh, particularly if it's anticipated that there'll be a large number of individuals included um, to check or the feasibility of the planned models and the, you know, the computational problem lies in the structure of the data set to anticipate. Um, so for the primary outcome of the Lustrum trial, the repeat chlamydia test in the index patient, 12 to 24 weeks of follow-up, we actually only anticipated a successful follow-up of around 50% of the index patients. Um, which raises the question of whether we required imputation for the missing data. And um, so in terms of estimation of treatment effects, some of you might be familiar with the fact actually if data are only missing for your primary outcome, sometimes it's not necessary to do any kind of imputation analyses if you assume that your outcome is missing at random, meaning that the um, patients you've observed the outcome in are broadly representative of patients you haven't observed the outcome in. Um, however, for this study, we also have the secondary outcome of partner treatment, which we can use to help predict our primary outcome in cases in which it's missing. Um, and indeed, we can use the outcome of primary outcome where it's recorded to help the missing outcome of partner treatment where that is missing. Um, because we have this quite high level of missing data for our primary outcome, um, it was planned in the protocol, and I think it's warranted that some kind of missing not at random sensitivity analysis. Um, was also conducted and so what this means is that you conduct a missing not at random sensitivity analysis you make some kind of specified assumption sorry i, I can see a hand up from artemis i don't know if that is a deliberate hand no <laughs> uh, i'm really sorry i'm really sorry i i tried to lower it please go on i'm sorry okay, no, no problem i was just checking there's no problem with sound or anything like that so uh, and under a missing not a random imputation analysis, you, you make some kind of specified assumption regarding the outcomes in the patients for whom it's missed, for, for whom the outcome is missing, and for this, how this might systematically differ from the patients in whom it's observed. So you make an assumption in this case, either that the patients in whom the chlamydia retest was missing were either more likely to be chlamydia positive at the follow-up period, at the time of the follow-up test, sorry, um, or you make the assumption that they're less likely to be at the time of the um, So again, for the imputation analyses, we have the complication of, of this hierarchical data structure um, for the data set collected within the Lustrum trial, where we've got the sex partners nested within index patients, nested within intervention and control periods, nested within clinics. Um, and ideally, we wanted to carry out an imp imputation procedure, which took account of this entire structure all at once and imputed missing outcomes both at the levels of the index patients and at the level of the individual sex partners. Um, so multiple imputation using this kind of multi-level structure is quite a new area for statistical methodology, which can take quite a long time to develop and for the new techniques to become established. Um, several software packages for multi-level imputation are available, but to my knowledge it's not directly implemented in this paper. Um, and so we chose to use the standalone BIMP software for our multiple imputation analyses, um, which allows up to three levels accounting for the hierarchical structure, um, meaning that we thought we would be able to include a level of the sex partner level, um, the index patient level, and the clinic period level, um, and then assume any correlation at the clinic level would be accounted for by clustering at the clinic period level. Um, however, when it came to implementing this in practice, I found that the planned model, um, the imputation procedures 
didn't converge for the for this planned full three level um, imputation model, taking account of the full structure of the data. And so the final imputation model that we've used for analysis is actually a simplified version um, in which we collapse the sex partner outcomes to the level of the index patient. So the imputation model includes the primary outcome of the chlamydia retest result in the index patient, um, but we've collapsed the sex partner outcomes to a single variable of one or more partner treated, which is defined at the level of the index patient. And so we were there, therefore unable to impute um, sex partner treatment outcomes at the individual level of each partner. So as, as was expected, there was around 50% missing, uh, missingness for the primary outcome of the chlamydia retest in the index patients. And so sensitivity analysis were warranted, certainly in terms of making varying assumptions regarding um, whether those cases with missing data were more or less likely uh, to be chlamydia positive at that point in time. So for these kinds of missing, not at random imputation analyses, there are some specialist um, software available. However, again, we have this complication of wanting to account for our multi-level structure of the data. Um, and so in order to allow this, we use the approach of Parkinson et al, which I've given the citation for here, it involves reweighting of missing at random imputations. So we were able to create missing, not at random treatment effect estimates using our missing at random imputation procedure as described and in reweighting those data sets um, when calculating uh, missing or not at random. So I'm just bringing together some general conclusions here. Um, so I found that the optimal analysis model for cluster randomized trials may not be immediately obvious and that some simulation analyses might be required to check the performance and feasibility in specific um, trial situations. Multiple imputation analyses are also more challenging for cluster structured data and the software and theory of this area is are still things that are under active development. Um, and I think that statistical analysis plans for data sets with complex structured data may require more flexibility or built in contingencies to anticipate the potential for problems that may arise when applying the planned analyses to the final. So I'll now pass back. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, great presentation. I, I'm aware of the of the time, so I, I suggest that we move to uh, Professor Nicola Low um, talk, and then we open the floor for questions. Thanks very much for that introduction. I'm starting from the end, which is always never a good good idea. Uh, but what I'm going to do is skip through very quickly. Uh, my reflections on uh, crossover trials in STI and HIV. And I don't know who's in the audience, but uh, I'm, in, oh dear, that's my high usage. I'm imagining that uh, some of you have not uh, been in the STI field as long as I have, and may not know a lot about some of the previous trials that have been done. So I'm really just going to give a brief description of some of those that I think are the most important. Um, so, of course, the reason that we would want to do uh, these kind of uh, um, cluster trials for uh, STI outcomes is because, uh, as Andrew explained to you, in the um, if your outcome uh, is related to uh, sexual behaviour and you're working within sexual networks, clearly you want to be able to deliver um, a, an outcome at a level that is going to um, uh, not be contaminated by people having um, uh, sex within their networks, but being individually allocated to an intervention or, or a control. And I'm going to take you back to the uh, um, what I think is probably the start of uh, cluster uh, crossover trials in the infectious disease field uh, is a book written uh, in 1996 uh, by Peter Smith uh, from the London School of Hygiene in which uh, they describe uh, something called a stepped wedge design. 
which has been used several times in the fields of HIV and STIs. And this trial design was first used or first reported in 1987 uh, as um, a trial that they were going to set up in the Gambia to test the first uh, vaccine against a sexually transmitted infection was against a hepatitis B infection. Although in fact, the trial in the Gambia was uh, targeted towards vaccinating children to prevent uh, liver cancer in later life. But here you can see uh, what uh, Andrew described uh, is the, um, in his initial talk is how the, the introduction of the intervention um, is randomized uh, over time and every community gets the intervention at some point and you enroll control periods uh, as you go along because you have the delays as communities are waiting for the intervention. Uh, and if you think of it in terms of a crossover trial, it is essentially a one way crossover cluster trial because everyone moves, crosses over from control to the intervention, but they don't cross back again. So this trial design was implemented in a classic trial in HIV research, which is called the Mwanza trial. It was done at a time when the HIV epidemic had started expanding very rapidly in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, sexually transmitted infections were, were very common and there were no uh, diagnostics for them. This is uh, 30 years ago and an intervention called syndromic management had recently been proposed and this was, uh, you know, well, this is uh, using STI syndromes to uh, give treatment when you don't have um, an etiological diagnosis. So the idea was that if you treated people for their STIs, you would reduce the cofactor co effect and then therefore reduce HIV incidence. So this was a step wedged uh, design in 12 communities in um, Mwanza in Tanzania and they were in pairs and they were and the uh, intervention was introduced through these uh, through these pairs and the outcome is incident HIV HIV1 infection and uh, what you can see is after two years where they did repeat they uh, did surveys of HIV seroprevalence in all the communities they achieved a reduction of nearly half in the incidence of HIV. And that was an absolutely um, major result because it gave a lot of enthusiasm and positivity for STI treatment to prevent uh, HIV. At around the same time that this trial was finishing, another trial was starting up in Rakai in Southwest Uganda. This trial was also cluster randomized uh, but it used a classic cluster uh, um, randomized design in 56 communities in southwest Uganda. And the intervention here was mass treatment. So this is really a, um, this is a proof of concept uh, to do mass treatment if you treat all of the STIs uh, with antibiotics uh, at regular intervals, then the uh, idea, the principle was that you should reduce STI incidence and therefore the cofactor effect. And what and they did this mass treatment in these communities uh, every 10 months over three rounds. And again, the outcome is incident HIV infection. So the results of the Rakai trial showed, in contrast to those of the Mwanza trial, that the rate ratio for HIV infection was the same in the communities that received the mass treatment and the communities that had received usual care. So a lot of soul searching. At the same time, there were other cluster randomized trials going on in other parts of sub-Saharan Africa, also trying different approaches to STI control. And in the end, the Mwanza trial was the only one that came out and had a, a positive result in reducing HIV. Uh, and there was a lot of soul searching about what should, uh, what, what should, what was the role of STI treatment. Uh, and in fact, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 
because of the arrival of, of anti, effective antiretroviral um, therapy, the STI treatment part has kind of fallen by the way, wayside and has, and as you well know now, STI diagnostics are still not, uh, are still not available in most of the, the continent. So the trial design itself did not go away. Uh, and was used in a trial in the Netherlands to look at the potential benefits of chlamydia screening, which uh, the hypothesis being that if you screen a large enough uh, proportion of the population uh, regularly enough, then you will be able to reduce both the incidence uh, and prevalence of chlamydia infection and its uh, reproductive tract uh, sequelae. So here is the, the picture that you can see showing what the stepped wedge design uh, was. It was done with um, it, the, these communities in three parts of the Netherlands were also stratified by their level of risk for chlamydia. Uh, and then they were randoms, randomized to uh, um, being to the in, introduction of the intervention. And there was a control uh, community that received uh, no chlamydia screening until the very last, um, until the very end of the trial. So they basically have a baseline prevalence result that was compared with the change in, it should have been the change in prevalence in the intervention communities. What you can see from the results of the mass invitations to all, at all young adults in these communities is that actually the uptake of this intervention was very low. Uh, and it went down after first, second and third uh, rounds, approximately uh, 10 months apart, uh, such that once again, the odds ratio for reduction in prevalence uh, in these communities that, that had multiple screening invita invitations compared to the control community was essentially uh, the same. So no um, impact there, but of course, very low uptake. So the trial that I want to come on to to explain now is truly a, a cluster crossover trial. This is a trial uh, in Papua New Guinea, and it's called the Women and Newborn Trial of Antenatal Interventions and Management. Uh, one time is a pidgin word meaning together uh, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, here you can see where Papua New Guinea is. We work in these uh, two places, one on the main uh, island in Madang and the other in uh, Kokopo in East New Britain. Uh, and if you don't know where Papua New Guinea is, Australia uh, and Darwin and Cairns are somewhere down here. And the rest of the world is to the left of the slide. What you can see is one of the communities in which we worked, or in fact, you can't see the community in which we worked because the bridge collapsed for half of the trial and we had uh, quite a long delay in enrollment, but we pressed on. Now, the reason for doing this trial in, um, Papua New Guinea is that the prevalence of STIs in uh, Papua New Guinea and other South Pacific Islands is incredibly high. What I've shown here in the light blue bars are the estimates that the World Health Organization has for uh, these curable sexually transmitted infections in 15 to 49 year olds worldwide. And what you can see in the darker blue bars are the estimates from a prevalence study done amongst uh, pregnant women. And this is one study, uh, but there are others that show very, very similar uh, results. 20 to 25% of women with chlamydia or trichomonas, 10 to 15% with chlamydia, with gonorrhea. So if, and the uh, idea is that treating STIs in pregnancy will reduce the adverse outcomes, in particular, uh, preterm birth and low birth weight. And screening for STIs in pregnancy is widely recommended, but there actually are no uh, randomized controlled trials of this intervention. So our idea of doing it with doing it here in Papua New Guinea, where the prevalence is so very high, is that if this intervention works, you're going to see an effect in a country with a high prevalence. Uh, and that's in contrast with the Lustrum trial prevalence of, of chlamydia and its reinfection. So here I am showing you uh, this trial outline really only to illustrate the difference from the Lustrum trial is that the um, one-time intervention is not just a one-off relating to one clinic visit. Antenatal care is a series of visits and these women are receiving the intervention at uh, every clinic, uh, clinic visit. Uh, the intervention is uh, testing for STIs at the point of care using the gene expert um, machine and, and a BV diagnostic at the point of care and treatment every 
uh, visit if they're positive compared with usual care, which is syndromic management. Here is the crossover design that you can see. Uh, in the first phase, they're randomly allocated either to the, um, the intervention with point of care diagnosis or to usual care. And then they cross over uh, after a washout period, uh, which allows training of the, um, of the uh, clinics that had not received the intervention first uh, and then start up again. Uh, and then, of course, then there is uh, an additional follow up period after here where we follow the neonatal uh, infections and complications. I'm only going to go into this uh, um, very briefly, but here you can see in one of the clinics how busy these clinics are. These are our, our um, nurses and community workers. Uh, they have to explain the trial, which they do to groups of women, uh, and then they're taken through for ultrasound. Uh, and then um, STI testing and treatment uh, if, if positive. And here in the neonatal follow-up, uh, we're taking nasopharyngeal swabs and eye swabs to look for chest infections and for um, ophthalmia neonatorum. As of April, despite COVID, which has suspended enrollment of the trial uh, in its final stages, we've enrolled 95% of our target for pregnant women and got primary outcomes in more than 98, 90 percent of these women at the end of their pregnancy, which is just fantastic. And we've also enrolled more than 90 percent of our target for neonates. And we'll be continuing enrollment up until the end of June, by which time we hope to have got to our target of 4,600 uh, pregnant women and 2,000 babies. So I'm going to really finish here just uh, by summarising to say that there is a long history of cl cluster trials in STI and HIV research using a range of different designs, depending on the setting and depending on the infection and the outcome. Uh, the crossover designs include the stepped wedge design, uh, but it remains a reasonably underused design, despite the advantages that Andrew explained to you, but maybe because of those and because of trials like Lustrum and One Time, it may become the new thing. There are advantages uh, and disadvantages, of course, of the, of, of the designs. One of the disadvantages is um, that uh, it's very hard to report baseline results because you only have the intervention periods uh, of half of the um, half of the um, uh, trial arms. Uh, and so we have to wait until we've completed the trial uh, and then to analyze the results uh, in what in one single go. But I'd be very, very happy to uh, answer questions on that. And I'll finish there for you, Artemis. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nicola, and all of the of the speakers. It, it has been uh, uh, an amazing uh, afternoon. And in the interest of uh, of time, because we only have five minutes, I would like to uh, ask uh, the audience, please, to contribute and uh, ask questions to this fantastic series of of speakers. So. Any questions from the audience? I see one from... One ben. in the Q&A? Q&A. Yeah, I'm just reading. Um, yeah. So this is to all of you. Uh, it was really interesting to hear about the analysis and all the challenges and complications you needed to address. Would you still recommend use of mixed effects models to others analyzing cluster randomized crossover trials from Becky Turner? Yeah, so I guess the kind of main, well, one of the main alternatives would be a generalized estimating equations approach. Um, or there are some people have recommended doing kind of cluster level summaries and then analyzing those together. Um, but the advantage of using mixed effect models is that we can include adjustment for individual patient level co-variables, which is more difficult if we have a cluster level summaries before conducting an analysis. Um, and it also, I think, is easier to account for multiple levels. So my experience of trying to put together um, generalized estimating equation analyses is that if you've got a single level of clustering, it's relatively straightforward using available software. But I think once you've got three or four levels of, of um, clustering, within a hierarchical data structure, I think it's a lot easier to implement mixed effect models, at least using the, the, the sort of 
Great. Thank you very much, Oliver. Are there any other questions? Um, if, if not, maybe um, uh, I could uh, uh, ask one, and it's, it's uh, open um, to all. Um, we heard that uh, uh, the cluster crossover design uh, is uh, uh, more uh, efficient. Um, would you recommend it? And we heard from uh, Nicola on uh, very nice examples, even for other infectious diseases. Would you would you recommend it in, in general for uh, even other infectious and possibly chronic diseases? And if so, what issues the trialists should be concentrating on based on your last room experience? Do you want to start, Andrew? Can I start? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Artemis. That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, as Nicola has shown, it has been used in a variety of settings. Um, you know, I've personally been involved with these sort of longitudinal type crossing forwards type designs, you know, in TB and so on. Um, particularly where there are clinic level policies, it's a very natural design. I think um, we shouldn't be influenced too much by fashion. We should always remember that if, if the intervention can be delivered at an individual level, then we really should start from that thinking that should be our default. Um, I think the arguments around pragmatism um, may be uh, overstated. I think we should think of individual randomized trials for individual interventions, interventions where possible. Um, I think the, the issue of which design, the um, I think as I alluded to in my talk, um, these crossover step ways, they're, they're very good designs where people are being gradually recruited so that each person really only gets one exposure. So at the end of the day, you've got a bunch of people who've had the control and a bunch of people who've had the intervention. It's very simple. And even with Nicola's um, one-time trial, uh, there was a, the, a big sort of a washout period in the middle, but still, um, so in a sense, unlike Lustrum, you couldn't just switch in two weeks like we did, but, but, but still, um, the participants, as I understand it, they still receive just control or intervention. So I think those those are the settings where I feel quite comfortable with these designs where things switch. I think you've got to be very careful with sort of chronic disease settings where patients are going to actually receive both exposures in the trial. The, um, you've got to be very careful. You would think as default that their period of exposure in whichever one comes first, that is going to influence what happens afterwards how they respond to the second exposure. So I think that's, I'd be really cautious. There will be times when it's okay, but I'd be really cautious about the, that kind of setting. I don't know if you had anything to add, Nicola. Uh, well, only to add that uh, you can say that individual allocation is a principle, but really if you have people in sexual networks, uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, I think it is a, on principle a reason for having a unit of randomization that is at least one level higher than the individual, and that might be at the partnership, but preferably in a sexual network uh, level, and particularly when sexually transmitted infections are very common. Um, the, I, I will. I would like to just add one thing that about the um, the one-time trial is that of. It, yes, it is a really you know, your antenatal care episode so that the, the trials, but the, it, it means that you lengthen the period of intervention because pregnancy goes on for a long time and then you have to, right. to follow up the, the babies as well. Uh, but uh, one thing is about having these kinds of interventions, and it's the same is true of the step wedge intervention, is when everyone wants the intervention that it is a very good way of being equitable. So if you have a low resource country and you are offering a point of care diagnosis and treatment, uh, the fact that all of the clinics got an opportunity to use this point of care diagnostic uh, and then have a control period was actually very, very successful in helping to enroll uh, both women and uh, enroll clinics as well. And actually, it's a comment from Claudia in the chat. Yes, if she wants to, if she wants to uh, elaborate on that. Yeah. 
Um, would, would you like, uh, Claudia, to uh, elaborate further? Uh, we see that uh, you agree that the step wedge would have led all clinics eventually around the intervention, but presumably some for a shorter period would may not have been uh, feasible. Um, yeah, I think, um, thank you for bringing me in here. I just couldn't resist. And I'm really just agreeing with Nicola, but in a different setting. So these were UK sexual health clinics that pre-COVID were really struggling and who very kindly offered to be part of this trial when it would make life quite difficult for them in terms of operationalizing the intervention in rammed clinics. So what, what swung it really for them was that they would all at some point get the offer of the intervention. Now, it did actually mean more work for them, which they didn't quite realise till afterwards. But that said, when I was going around uh, looking for clinics who might be interested, it would have been really difficult if the trial design had meant that some would never get the intervention or indeed, from my understanding of step wedges, had we done it that way, some clinics would have had the intervention for quite a short period, which might have led to just difficulties with feasibility as healthcare professionals needed to get grooved in delivery of the intervention. And likewise, some of the clinics involved from the start may not have been able to sustain the trial with the intervention for, for a much longer period. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it has been um... Uh, really informative and interesting uh, uh, afternoon. I would like to ask uh, uh, Sarah, uh, for the sake of all of us, I see this event is recorded. Uh, can we, um, can we, where will the link be available in the same uh, place uh, or um, how can we access yeah, so it again? The recording is going to be available yeah, on the Lustrum Programme YouTube channel. So as soon as this has been wrapped up, I'm going to post it on there and then share it via our Lustrum social media. So on Twitter at Lustrum underscore five. Um, but thank you so much, Artemis, for being an incredible chair. And thank you so much to Andrew, Oliver and Nicola for all of your contributions. Um, it's been a really insightful conversation. And for me, as someone who has not the level of expertise in methodology and child design as you all, I think it's really incredible to get all of that in one go. And Nicola. I just comments. really wanted, it was a very, very final uh, comment to say that the one-time trial is, of course, not uh, initiated or run by me, who's run from the University of New South Wales uh, in, in Australia and the people who are working there in PNG, but I've been taking credit for it today. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Okay, that's good to clarify. Thank you so much. Um, you. And to all of you, thank you for coming. And... We hope that you know you have a good rest of your week. Um, yeah, and this will be available on the Lustrum YouTube channel. So thank you all. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye bye.